Our first reading this morning is taken from Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Each one should test his own actions. Then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else. For each one should carry his own load. Anyone who receives instruction in the word must share all good things with his instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. This is the word of the Lord. Our gospel reading is from Matthew 18, verses 1 through 14. Would you please rise for the reading of the gospel? At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to sin. Such things must come, but woe to the man through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into the fire of hell. See that you do not look down on one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go to look for that one that wandered off? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he is happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Check one, two, there it is. Okay. Um, last week we started a little series that uh, 
is going to take us about six weeks, and we're trying to tag on to some words that you see around here and just kind of help build the lexicon of things that we know and kind of understand what they mean. And the word that we started with last week was belong. And that word is really laden with a lot of concepts, and we talked about how there's a sociological element of when you, belonging is part of group dynamics, and how um, you want to try and fit into groups, and we looked at Charlie Brown and how he couldn't just quite fit in. But really, we looked to spend a little bit more time on the psychological side of that, and talked about the reality that if you want to belong, emotionally belong, you have to make yourself vulnerable, and you have to make yourself open to speaking to people about things that matter, things of the heart. It's not just a head trip, it's revealing who you are in your heart. And then we talked about a little bit, we started to build out a theology of belonging. And that's kind of where I want to pick up today, is this business of a theology of belonging. We talked last week about how it's God's declarative statement you are mine. You belong to me. That's kind of what makes us belong. It's not because we're the coolest kids in town, and unlike Charlie Brown, we fit in in every group. You don't fit in in every group. That's just the reality. There's going to be places you don't fit. And there's going to be times when you're going to be shy to reveal yourself. Maybe you just don't trust the people. But there is one way in which we all belong. It's by the declarative word of God. And what does he put us into? What do we belong to? It's the very bride of Christ. It is the amazing beauty that God has created in this living organism that's called church. And so really, we want to kind of explore that today. What does it mean to be church, and what are the implications for that in our everyday life? First of all, I want to share a statement that I wrote that we put on our website, and it says this, God's presence at grace gives you a place to belong. God's presence at grace. It's not because you're super cool, and you are, but it's not because of that. It's because God is here. God is in his temple. Let all earth keep silent. We are in awe of the mighty God who comes, and he does his work. The Holy Spirit, Martin Luther said in his catechism, many of you would remember these words, he calls, he gathers, and he enlightens. The Holy Spirit is the one who's drawing you together. The Holy Spirit, believe it or not, prompted you to get out of bed this morning and show up at this place. Why do you do it? Well, because my parents told me it was a good thing. No, because the Holy Spirit has called you. The Holy Spirit has gathered us, and the Holy Spirit is the one who enlightens us. He works when we show up, and he, he stretches us, and he makes us into new people. Well, what happens when we come together? Something called community happens. Community is really a compound word that has two root words, common unity we share a common unity that is christ he is the one who binds us together and he is the one that unifies us at the end of our reading this morning we said we saw these words that pastor steve just read it says we belong to the family of believers he's gathered us together in community around this central person of Jesus that binds us together. It sounds nice, it sounds easy, but it's not. It's messy, because all families are messy. Even the family of God is messy. Think about the first family, Adam and Eve, right? They're two boys, Cain and Abel. What happened? Murder. It's a messy family. Yet that's a family that God is using. I'm teaching a study through First and Second Samuel, and in Second Samuel it gets really messy. Remember David and Bathsheba? And then he kills off Uriah, and then he's acting like nothing's happening, and then Jonathan comes and he gives him this parable and says, you are that man! And he repents. And God uses messy families. And David's kids are a mess. Absalom kills off Amnon and all of, you know, who had raped Tamar, the sister. Has all, oh, it's, it's messy. Families 
are messy. And the family of God is messy. And actually, that gives me great comfort. Because I don't have to be the perfect pastor with the perfect family who gives the perfect message. I don't have to. I can't. And neither can you. And neither do you. And neither will you. Life is not clean and sterile. Life is messy. And that's the way it is. And there's whole books of the Bible that are written about this saying life is messy. And God, I don't like it when this stuff happens. One's called Lamentations. It's a lament. It's like, ah, God, I don't like it when life is like this. Most authors or most commentators would say that there's about 40 psalms that are psalms of lament that cry out to God and say, I don't like this. Life is messy. And you and I know the reality of that. Even though we are hardwired for common unity, that common unity is hard to find in this day and age, especially in this day and age. This past week, I came across an article that I shared with our staff and a few others of you by a guy named Arthur Brooks. It's an excerpt from his book, Love Your Enemies. And in the New York Times article that he wrote, he states this, political, I'm quoting, political scientists have found that our nation is more polarized now than it has been in any time since the Civil War. Our nation is now more polarized than any time since the Civil War. He goes on. It is comparable, as social scientists measure these things, it is comparable to the disunity between the Palestinians and the Israelis. That's in our country right now. Each side thinks that, the other, that their side is driven by benevolence while the other side is driven only by hatred and evil. Wow. Our country today? That divided? Yeah. He goes on to state, it's something worse than incivility and intolerance at work in our country here. It is contempt. The unsullied conviction of the worthlessness of the other the unsullied conviction of the worthlessness of the other. It's pretty opposite of what we heard in Galatians chapter 6 that Pastor Steve read. Let me give you a little taste of what those verses said. Live by the Spirit and restore one another gently. Carry one another's burdens. Test your own actions without comparing them to another. Do not grow weary of doing good. Let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. Huh. That sounds a lot more like concern than contempt. And yet as I look around, it's pretty easy to find things that people are contemptuous about. Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservative, rural versus urban, black versus white, maskers versus anti-maskers, climate change, it's fake, it's real, BLM versus police violence, blah, 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 and it goes on and on and on and on and on. We live in a contemptuous world, period. It is the way our world is going. Interestingly, I, I haven't seen this yet, but I've been given some Reader's Digest footnotes on it. Um, there's a series out there on Netflix um, that is called, where did I put it? Well, okay, I'm gonna, Social Dilemma, The Social Dilemma. And in The Social Dilemma, what they identify are that these logarithms that are used by Facebook and YouTube and, and Twitter and all of these things, they actually do something pretty interesting. They keep taking you back to people who have like-mindedness of you, and so what you do is you spiral in more and more on those things, and you become less able to hear anyone else. They are creating a contemptuousness. Why? Because it sells. You and I are being used. It's the way it works. Did you know CNN is making money? And Fox News is making money by selling you just the opposite kind of slant on things. It's all a mess. 
because these are human broken systems. They're human broken systems. And if you're trying to find the answer to anything there, you're always going to be coming up wanting. Human broken systems live with contempt, not concern. Somebody's making money off of you and me by peddling the hype. We're being played by both sides. And where's Jesus? Where's Jesus in the midst of this? Well, I think he's grieving over the loss of common unity, of community. We shrink and we have these dividing walls of hostility. Ephesians 2 was pretty transparent. Paul is writing to these people and he's saying there were two camps here. There was the, there was the Gentile camp and there was the Jew camp and they were both Christian camps, but these people grew up with this background and these people grew up with this background and they're fighting. Listen to what he says. For he himself, Jesus, is our peace. He made the two groups one. He destroyed the dividing wall of hostility, this barrier that goes up between the two groups. Jesus tore it down. In his one body, he reconciled them both through the cross. And he put to death the hostility that so easily ensnared them. We are no longer foreigners and aliens, but we're fellow citizens of God's kingdom. His whole body, his whole building is being joined together and rises as a holy temple to God. That's what happens when common unity takes root. Jesus builds the body. But there are so many dividing walls of hostility in our culture. So, Israelis and Palestinians, Democrats and Republicans, Black Lives Matter and anti-Black Lives Matter, no, maskers and no-maskers, COVID's real, COVID's not real, all of these issues, spirit of contempt and bitterness takes root. What's the answer? Well, the gospel reading... It's pretty clear. Become like little children. Become like little children. We aspire to more than rhetoric of broken human systems. We aspire to be childlike and being kingdom bearers in this world. That's what God has called us to do, to bring the kingdom to bear, to be kingdom leaders. What does that look like? Well, one of the great um, privileges and, and joys of the past season or so of my life, about a dozen years ago, I started working um, towards a, a project that turned into a program that turned into something that has some teeth in it today, and that was Academy Four. Kind of the idea was, what could we bring to bear in students at this point in life when they still think adults are cool, and they haven't started yet rolling their eyes because mom's talking to them, right? And so they start to, what could you do to impact young people? And we came up with this, or it was kind of my thing, I, I was given the assignment of coming up with a curriculum, and, and fourth graders can get this. Now, they don't have the whole biblical context because we're using this in public schools, but what I want to do is ask you to pretend like you're a fourth grader for a second, okay? And go along with me. So I'm going to have you do some hand motions, stuff like that. All right? So go with me. We came up with this acrostic that spells out the word leaders. But what I want to say is kingdom leaders. If kingdom leaders who help people belong, help bring a sense of belonging to anybody who would show up in this place, kingdom leaders bear these same characteristics that we're trying to teach fourth graders. And the very first thing that we're trying to teach fourth graders is to listen. Do that with me. Listen. Yeah. I doubt that anybody else in the room has had this experience lately. I could be wrong. But uh, about once or twice a week, I have been going to a laundromat in South Oak Cliff to help my sister do her laundry over the last couple of months. 
And in the laundromat in South Oak Cliff, I hear a very interesting conversation that I usually just try and listen to. And so this last time when I was there about a week ago, I walked in and there was these, there was these two older gentlemen speaking, and they were talking about the election. And basically, if we can get all, all of the minorities out to win, we'll win the election. And they had this democratic slant, obviously. And they, they went into this how Trump had cheated the election and how the Russians had helped him win and how Bush won because his brother was governor of Florida and they won the hanging chad because of that. And there was a part of me that went, what? And another part that said, if those guys would show up at Grace on a Sunday morning, would they feel like they belong? And I said, they wouldn't if I approached them with my background, but if I think like them and start to say, you know what, I wonder how they got those beliefs, and ask them, and I started to listen and lean in, and started to not judge, but just say, tell me about why you think that. It, one person even said to me as I was describing this, they said, maybe you should just say to them, you're right, whether you believe it or not, because that opens the door for conversation. I don't know what the right thing was to do. You know what I did? I sat there and thought and prayed for about 20 minutes. I didn't know what to say. But I knew this, that there was a part of me that wanted to make a deal out of it. <clears throat> I'm right, you're wrong, shut up. We talked about that last week, right? Where does that lead? Does anybody come to belong to the kingdom of God through that attitude? I'm right, you're wrong, shut up. No, that doesn't help. But that is the spirit of our times. Friends, God has called us to see beyond the spirit of our times, to rise above that, because there is a kingdom that is not a kingdom of this world. It is the kingdom of God. And the only way, the only way people are going to get that is when his body listens. We can't come with our judging attitudes. Me too. I'm not pointing fingers. I'm saying me. We have to listen. The second thing that uh, kingdom leaders who help people belong do is they encourage. They come alongside people and say, you know what? You can do stuff. You have abilities. You have gifts. You can do stuff. And we encourage them. You know, that Arthur Brooks quote that I mentioned before does just the opposite. It says this, unsullied conviction of the worthlessness of another human being. That's what contempt is. And the hype peddlers in our society are driving us to that, whether we do it knowingly or not. We're being used. It's just the way it is. If you have a conviction that others are worthless, people are never going to feel welcomed here. They're never going to feel like they belong here. We have to bring a spirit of encouragement. We have to cheer people on. So I want you to go like this. Say, encouragement. These are like our megaphones where we're cheering people on. We're encouraging them. Whoop, whoop. You can do it. God has given you gifts. God has got you. God, God has a purpose for your life. I don't get to say that to four, fourth graders in public schools. But in a place like this, God has a purpose for your life. What could there be that's more encouraging than that? A purpose given by the Almighty God. The third thing that true kingdom leaders do is they have a positive attitude. Philippians 2 says it this way, your attitude should be the same as Jesus Christ, who being in the very nature of God did not consider privilege, heavenly privilege, something to be grasped, but rather he made himself nothing to the point of death on the cross. He humbled himself, became a man to the point of death on a cross. 
That's an attitude and a belief in us. That Jesus gave up his privilege that you and I might belong. It's an amazing thing what he did. We have a positive attitude. I want you to go like that and say, leaders have a positive attitude. Kingdom leaders have a positive attitude. Yeah, and I'm not just talking about like, I have a, a couple people in my life who I've known who no matter when you ask them, they always say, things are great. And I'm like, no, they're not. Things aren't always great. I'm not talking about a Norman Vincent Peale power of positive power of positive thinking thing, not like that. I'm talking about something that helps you, because you know that this temporal life is temporal. You have a positive attitude because you know the ultimate outcome, that Jesus is coming for you and he's making all things new. The resurrection is real. Life with him forever is real. It's not a fairy tale. You have a positive attitude because you're anchored in a true and certain hope. It's a real thing. And because of that, we are always growing. We are always developing. So I want you to go like this. I want you to go, developing. All right. Arnold Schwarzenegger, like, you're growing big muscles. Yeah. <laughs> Christians are lifelong learners. The Holy Spirit never stops working on you, shaping you, making you into something new. You know, from about 25 on, our bodies kind of go like that, right? But the reality of it is, is our spirits are constantly being molded and shaped by the Almighty God. He is pressing upon us in such a way that he's making his very spirit in us. We're constantly developing and growing. Being sanctified is the big fancy church word for that. Kingdom leaders who help people belong are lifelong learners allowing the Holy Spirit to shape us. We don't get stuck in our ways. We don't say, I know what's best. Sit down and shut up to people. We say, God, what are you saying here now? Shape me and mold me. Holy Spirit, come. Kingdom leaders live by example. The E stands for example. What example did Jesus leave us? He said this. He said, take up your cross and follow me. Follow me. And as you follow me, things aren't always going to be easy. There will be days of lament, days of difficulty, but follow me. Jesus sets the example for us. And when we see somebody who's a good example, we go like this. Thumbs up. Give me a thumbs up. Yeah, good job. Kingdom leaders are people who lead by example. A couple more. Kingdom leaders have a high level of respect. They actually treasure things and people to such a degree that we hold precious the people that God has put into our lives. You know, my wife has a, a project that when she was in college, she spent hundreds, if not thousands, of hours working on. It's an alabaster sculpture of kind of an abstract of a man sitting, and, and it's really, really, really cool. But you know what happens every time we go to move it? Be careful! <laughs> Why? Because alabaster is not super hard like marble. Alabaster is kind of a soft stone. And if you drop it, kabooey, thousands of hours down the drain. What's the crowning jewel of all of creation? It's not alabaster sculptures. It's people. How much more precious should we hold people? How, oh man, God, this is the crown jewel of your creation, the person who's sitting across from me, the person who's checking me out at Walmart, the person who's, well, I was going to say filling up my gas, but that doesn't happen anymore, right? Unless it's you or your wife, but that, yeah, the people we respect, we treasure, we hold gently, we love people. So cup your hands and say, kingdom leaders who help people belong, respect. Last but not least, kingdom leaders are servants. Kingdom leaders serve. 
we invest in the things that matter most to, pe- to God, and that's people. Jesus really showed us the way to serve. That's what he calls us to do. So I want you to stick your arms out like this. Kingdom leaders serve. Good job. Kingdom leaders serve. Yeah, we're not wrapped in on ourselves. We're not thinking my way is the highway, and if you don't agree with me, get out of here, Jack. We actually say, let me understand you a little bit more. Tell me about that. God, help me learn. God, help me listen. God, help me respect. God, help me. All right, so here's what I want to do. I want to ask you to put it all together for me. Talk about what kingdom leaders do. So kingdom leaders, listen. Kingdom leaders, encourage. Kingdom leaders have a positive attitude. Kingdom leaders are developing. Kingdom leaders are examples. Kingdom leaders, respect. Kingdom leaders serve. Keep your arms there for a minute. Dear God, we thank you. We thank you that you came to serve us. We thank you that Jesus, you would stretch out your arms wide that we might be welcomed into your family, that we could belong because of your action on the cross for us. And we thank you that the cross is not the ultimate reality, but that the resurrection has come and that we too look forward to a day when people no longer put their hope in broken human structures but in the truth of God, that Jesus is the first fruit of the resurrection. Lord, may we live that message with enthusiasm and joy that people around us would know that there's something different. We ask it in the name of him who died that we might live. And all of God's people said together, amen, amen. I'm going to invite you to stand as we speak words reminding us of who God is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. And the third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.